So last week, just to recap what we went through last week to follow up with this week. Um, so Tehran has basically targeted all these different areas you see in red in Israel. Um, they're ready for a counterstrike and they're just itching for the opportunity. Um, and we don't know when that's going to come. There's been more developments this week. Does anybody have any news to share on Iran's situation? Yes, Jason. When I read this and I saw this, I was prompted to think of the 80s, uh, where a similar map was put up, but it wasn't Israel and Tehran. It was the United States and Russia. Mm -hmm. It's the exact type of map where hey, these are the strategic targets in the United States that we as Russians think we ought to blow up with nuclear bombs. And I looked at it and I went, yeah, that, that isn't unusual. And if military leaders don't have this type of map of Israel or any enemy of theirs, uh, mm -hmm. they're not doing a very good job, right? So I looked at this and went, yeah, uh, okay. I, I, I wasn't... It's meant to be a deterrent. I, I was not um, concerned because this should happen, right? It, it, enemies of Israel should have an outline of what they think are important targets. Well, yeah. I mean, it's just that they haven't been published before, but anyway. Um, I read that Putin wants promises from the world that they won't attack him if he invades Ukraine. We're going to get to that one. Okay. Because this is Israel and and Iran, but does anybody else have anything new that happened this week about this? If not, I'll move on. So um, Israel's also restricted their, their travel completely. They're not allowing people to leave the country. Um, there's also been more night strikes over the past week, and this big issue that came about was a result of the United Nations um, getting together and basically uh, the General Assembly made resolution 129.11 um, that basically claimed that the Temple Mount was not Jewish and solely um, a Muslim shrine, and that included 129 countries who made that decision. Um, so th these are just very significant things that are happening right at the end that I, I think should concern us. Um, and Isaiah says, look at Zion, the city of festival times, your eyes will see Jerusalem, a peaceful pasture, a tent that does not wander, and a tent peg that will not be pulled up, nor any of its cords be um, loosened. And then we, I showed you this, which is basically giving you um, all the different countries that voted for this resolution. Um, and then the other ones that came about was um, the third resolution approved 100 uh, 94 to 8, sorry, 94 to 8, with uh, 69 abstentions calling Israel to withdraw to the Golan um, and oppose were Australia, Canada, Israel, Marshall Islands, all the United States, and the United Kingdom. So I think that's just like amazing that they're passing all these resolutions of the United Nations. Yes. Out any history of Israel having any affiliation with the Temple Mount? I know, I, I think it's ridiculous. I don't, I don't know, how, I don't know even, how that's even. I don't know, even know how it's possible either. I mean, that, that's literally what it said. Israel never had anything at all to do with the Temple Mount. This, this is the article. So it says the assembly voted 148 to nine with 14 abstentions on another resolution called the Peaceful Settlement. Oh, that's, this is the earlier one. I'm gonna go back one. It was 129 to 11 on Wednesday of last week that disavowed Jewish ties to the Temple Mount and called for the solely its Muslim name of Al Haram Al Ashi Al Sorry, sorry. I'd have to investigate that further. I just wanted to make sure you guys had had seen this because I think it makes um, the tensions grow higher between the Muslim world and the Jewish world even though there's been the Abraham Accords with Bahrain and UAE, and now Morocco, I think, is looking at it, and there's a couple others. So it's just, that's why I find it pretty unbelievable that this is going on. So I'm just sharing that with you. 
but the other one was this one, which is 148 to 9 with 14 abstentions. Um, but the international community refused to render assistance with settlement activities and also called for the Independent Peace Conference in Moscow. So, um, and that's the chart. Since it's too small to read, uh, can you um, just identify those that were against? Because the against is the pretty smallest number. Um, was yes. the United States against this resolution? Was the UK against this? Is who? who what the are the countries that opposed the text were Australia, Canada, Canada, Hungary, Israel, the Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, Palau, and the United States. And that's the one that that's above about. Um, Again, countries were against it, uh, except for the United States, Canada, and Australia. <laughs> Oh, you mean, okay, that's the best I could do, I'm sorry. Um, Australia was one that's in that column. Yeah. Yeah, they did. These are all the ones that opposed what was done. It was Australia, Canada, Hungary, Israel, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, Nauru, Palau, and the United States. And then the third resolution, which is a 94 to 8, with 69 abstentions, called on Israel to withdraw from the Golan Heights. Abstain. Sorry. I believe the ones that are X are abstentions. I don't know about the ones that maybe they were absent. I don't know. All right, this is a screenshot, so directly from... Yep. It's just that on all, there's three resolutions, all that happened last week, that were against Israel from the um, General Assembly. So I just think it's significant because we're, we're starting to see the pro prophetic fulfillment of all nations coming up against that. Israel. See the graphic. Okay. Over there. I don't mind. No, sorry. Here, take it over there. I just turn it up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Regarding the nuclear deal, Come on, take a picture. Thank you. Nuclear program I don't in there, though. Between the U.S. and Israel. Um, Can you hear it? Emerged during the talks this week after a short period um, of strong, strong relations between the new Israeli government and the new American one. Long running differences over how to deal with the Iran nuclear program have erupted into tensions between Biden administration and Israel, with senior Israeli officers leaving Washington this week. The concerns of the Americans' commitment to restoring the 2015 nuclear deal will lead to the flawed agreement allowing Tehran to speed ahead with its nuclear enrichment program. The strains were evident all week as the Biden administration sought to have an alliance with Israel into a united front about how to deal with, the, with Iran over the next year. In an effort to close the gap, American officials let out word this week that two months ago, Mr. Biden asked his national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, to review the Pentagon's revised plans and make military actions if uh, the diplomatic efforts collapse. So they're kind of at cross purposes. Biden's trying to fold Israel into his plan to revitalize the 2015 plan. Israel doesn't want that because it's a threat to them. So they're being told they're kind of kind of have to go it alone. Um, and it's, it's a very strain, strenuous situation for the new prime minister of Israel to deal with this because um, Europe is not real solid on the um, support of Israel regarding Iran. Anybody have any questions on this? Or okay. We talked about the Iran nuclear deal and where the nuclear weapons are scattered throughout um, Iran. And then it's, it's not getting any better because they're propping up a bad deal from the past. This is sort of a roadmap telling us and I can send you these slides so you can read them better, um, about how this all has happened. Um, so I can read, I think, the one on the left. What sanctions have been lifted? The US uh, no longer has bar firms on buying any is Iranian oil and gas. 
EU okays trade in key sectors. The U.S. embargo remains limited. And business allows uh, is allowed. Removes hundreds of Iran companies from blacklists. Um, that was the original one. That's a historic agreement. Sanctions still in place. No work on missiles for nuclear weapons for eight years. No selling of weapons for five years. No transfer of nuclear technology to Iran for peaceful purposes for a decade. Um, what this means for Iran is that Iran can increase the oil exports revenue of 10 billion. 30 billion of frozen foreign reserves will be brought back and will boost the GDP by 5% in 2016 and 17, almost zero right now. Um, or will it oil get cheaper? The price, uh, prices lowest in 11 years, Iran. Um, to offer more discounts, more to trigger prices within within a war with Saudi Arabia. So that's another thing that's going on is Saudi Arabia and Iran are constantly going back and forth trying to make cheaper gas so they can undercut the other company. Um, and this is a, a very long map of talking about um, the Iranian nuclear deal and where it is today. So the point of it is to us is that um, that whole Levant state is constantly being worked on from Russia through Iran, um, through um, Iraq into Syria and Lebanon, um, all for the ability to be able to get at Israel um, in the long run. I've read that it doesn't matter what's done with the treaty. Iran's going full speed ahead to get this nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not holding back at all. Nope, they haven't all along. It's been, it's been very bad. The problem is, is that they hate the United States so much they could use it on us as well as Israel. So there's really no, no stopping that. Um, we talked about the tornado last week and how many deaths it caused and how much damage there was. It was a 200 mile long tornado. You can see um, the areas that were affected in Arkansas, Missouri, Tennessee, um, part of Illinois and into Kentucky. And that's the size of it. And why, what's amazing to me is it basically stretches from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to the Great Lakes, which is a pretty huge storm. And very unusual to happen in December. Um, so that, I think that's remarkable, because you just don't see tornadoes of this size this time of year, hardly at all. Um, there have been some, but it's mostly unlikely. You can see the tornado damage. And we started to get into this one, which was the end of repentance. And it's a new law that has been passed by Canada, basically to wipe away the ability counseling for anybody who is in the um, LGBTQQS plus BLT group. I guess what's going on around. Um, so they, they sent this through very quickly, and basically they're, they're saying anybody who tries this um, conversion therapy um, will be going against the law. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay. Um, so we, went, we went, part, went over this partly last week. Um, I'm gonna, can, can we, nobody can read that, right, or except for... You, can you read it, Jesse, the, on the left? Yeah, you the conversion column. therapy, as it has been called, seeks to change a person's sexual orientation to heterosexual or gender identity to cisgender. It can include seeking to repress someone's non-heterosexual attraction or oppressing a person's gender expression or non-cisgender identity. These practices can take various forms, including counseling and behavioral modification, They've been opposed by numerous health and human rights groups. So we're not just talking about trying to force gays to try to become straight or kidnapping children and subjecting them to torture in a secret reprogramming camp. God forbid, there's no genuine Christian I know of on the planet who would agree to such practices, nor is there a counselor I know who would engage them. If that is what is meant by conversion therapy, then of course we should all oppose it. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. The reality is that this new bill actually prohibits Christians from practicing their faith when it comes to homosexuality and bisexuality and transgenderism. It also prohibits people who want to get help to pursue change, whatever their age, 
from pursuing that change, as well as it is change away from being, uh, as long as it, it is change away from being gay or bi or trans. So just remember this, like this kind of change happens in small baby steps and increments till we get the full picture. Is this the end of the road? Where is the end of the road? Where is it gonna go from here? Yeah, so once you knock down what marriage is, once you take out any going back once you've decided to go this way, um, then it's just gonna be the next thing and the next thing. So my point of view is, is that they're doing this now in 10 years, it might be bestiality, it might be who knows what. It'll just keep on going because they're taking out all the roadblocks between um, the society and what man wants to do versus what God wants to do. Go ahead, Robert. You can kind of see the progression when our daughters were in school, that's when prayer was taken out and thought, okay, well, that's, you know, that'll be the end of it. That was just the beginning of it. And it's progressed beyond what we, you know, anyone thought. And we're starting to learn more and more now. So that you're right, increments is the way it's being established, but then it becomes huge after that period of time. We're just, we're beyond the breaking point of Christians being able to stop it almost. Go ahead, Andy. Now, are you saying that our, our brethren in Canada cannot teach that the Bible is against these things? No, it's counseling. They're cutting out counseling to reverse the course of straying from <laughs> uh, heterosexual lifestyles. Okay. So they're saying counseling can't take place anymore. Um, right. Conversion. Counseling. Rebecca? Conversion is from homosexual to heterosexual or whatever the deviant mm -hmm. behavior is back to the norm. So they've just completely flipped the definition of As a matter of fact, original if you versus conversion. Have any inclinations in that area at all? You have to go in that direction more or less. So, uh, Rebecca? I, I was just going to say this has been going on and I don't want to sidetrack the whole Sunday school, but um, I think it's something that we really need to start talking about within our body. Uh, it's been going on. It is, um, as a middle school teacher, anybody can use whatever bathroom they want to use. Girls' bathroom, boys' bathroom, it matters not. Um, we have students in 7th and 8th grade already transitioning, and uh, one of, there's a big push to get rid of pronouns such as he and she. So this is a real thing and something I think we need to talk so about. So when you say transitioning in 7th and 8th grade, what do you mean? I mean, I had a student, for example, last year, her name was Lillian Parker, and she is now dressed as a boy and in the process of converting. She's in therapy. Uh, she now goes by Parker, and she wishes to be a man. Okay. I can send it to you afterwards. I mean, I, I can't do it right now, but I'll, I'll send you the link. Yeah, it was in one of the weekly World Watches as well as the, the one that comes from New York. Sorry, that was the other thing I was going to mention, Joe. I, I had a student five years ago. Um, her parents were very Christian, and her parents sent her to conversion therapy. Um, and it is. It's extremely controversial, but it's a real thing. Yep, it is. So the community in Canada doesn't want this to end. I, what I was going to do is um, read Second Timothy 3, because he tells us this was going to happen. Um, difficult times ahead, but you know this. Difficult times will come in the last days where people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, which is what we're really seeing all around us, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding a form of godliness but denying its power, avoid these people, for among them who... Among them are those who will worm their ways into houses and capture idle women, burdened down with sins, led along by the variety of passions, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. 
just as Jonathan Jambres resisted Moses, so these people also resist the truth, men who are corrupt in mind, worthless in regard to the faith, but they will not make further progress, for their lack of understanding will be clear to all, all and theirs was also. So, um, anyway, to, to us, I think this is, Canada's a little bit more progressive on this front than the United States, and my point is, it may be coming here sooner than, than later. Uh -huh. it, it seems like the UK is starting to get into this situation, discussing a kind of, I don't know, think groups or think tanks, whatever you right. have it. I'm, I'm interested how the mainstream churches are responding to this, you know, whether they're it's seeing this as a problem or not, because they are. You know, in general, it's the mainstream churches that are um, what's practicing this conversion therapy. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I, I don't know. The biggest news is the yeah. Methodist church just split over this. So Hadn't that they was, already split? I'm sorry? Hadn't they already split? Or there was some well, other larger... There's been splits in all the major denominations over history. This is another big one that they just split over again. So it, what to me is the big danger is the, the churches are getting more and more dis, um, divisive with each other. So they're fractionalizing and getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Meanwhile, what did the government learn about how it could control the churches during COVID? Yeah, they issued a mandate and what happened? Right. So... To me, what's interesting about that is this separation of church and state. <laughs> How do you weigh that in the balance with telling all of them to shut down? So now that they know that, what is the GLBQ community going to try to impose through the government on the churches? What's the next thing? Anything classified as public health is now under the uh, governmental control. So whether it's going to be health-related, truly health-related, or public health uh, misconstrued as um, redefining biological differences, um, now that the government has a foothold into churches, uh, that foothold, that, that foot in the door will only get bigger and bigger. Yeah, the, the big fear to me is, is that if you're a church that doesn't support the alternative version of what they want for marriage, what's going to happen to the church, its community, the assets, the building? You know, if the government gets their way, well, not the government, I would say this community is able to get the government to be their puppet, what's going to happen? That's why this particular ecclesia has an advantage because we've always taken the position that no outside person can get married here. If right. we had not had that position, then a gay person would say, well, you let so-and-so get married here, so you got to let me get married here too. But yeah. we've been universally uh, consistent on that practice, so we don't have that worry, I don't believe. Right. It's just a serious issue that's going to be happening to a lot of ecclesias, and people are going to have to make a stand one way or the other. To answer your question, Joe, the um, uh, tell me your question again so I can get my train of thought back. <laughs> what do you think yeah. the, the next uh, step the, is? Yeah, they're going to take away their uh, your tax exempt status as a church. You're going to be taxed one. just like a business, and if you don't toe the line, then we're not going to give you the advantage of um, that we receive now. Right, and we're seeing that. Uh, being pushed by the Democrats mostly. Rebecca? But I think the flip opposite is also a value to discuss. Remember how the government mandated that, you know, we should all be wearing masks a year ago, whatever, in, in churches, mm -hmm. and churches all over the place were like, you know, still doing their own thing type of thing. So I think there's still going to be enough, there will be some holdout that's not going to just toe the line. Right. You know? with this kind of thing, but it is, it's everywhere. And I think as a body, we really need to start talking to our youth about it. We do because they're getting, they're getting fed. And if we say nothing, what are we doing to them? We're giving them one point of view on the whole issue. 
and that's what they're being taught in school. So if we abstain from talking about it, then what's going to happen? Yeah. Being taught it by their friends, their, their yep. closest friends, my, some of my own colleagues. I mean, that's what the message they're getting for seven or eight hours a day. So as, as parents and as a community, we need to start talking about this in a Christ-like, loving way. Right. Ethan? I'll be honest, as a young person, I know a lot of Christadelphians, um, you know, teenagers and children who are currently thinking about their sexuality, their gender, about changing things. I know a lot of people in my friend circles who have um, tried experimenting with other people because that's what they're being taught in schools. They're like, this is normal outside, so why can't it be normal in the church? And so, because it was never really addressed as us in communities. It's always been told, this is bad, but we don't talk about it. It's taboo. This is something that we do need to address because it is currently going on in all ecclesias across like the United States and in other countries. And this is why we're losing young people because the world is getting a hold into them. And the young people are like, this is more fun. This is, this is more free. I feel constricted in this because this has never really been talked about. And this is something that I feel is now part of my identity. My religion, it, although it is part of my identity, it's not what I want to be my focal point in life. Right, right. And it, it needs more It needs more explanation because a lot of people are unfamiliar with God's view on it. Yes. I, I do uh, think this also, like, is worth, I mean, to this whole topic of point, this is worth a lot of, for each of us, a lot of personal study and thought how to approach this because this isn't anything new you know like this subject matter is but i mean women's roles has been like a, a topic of controversy in christadelphia for decades and i don't want to say that like we're behind the times or unscriptural about it but you know i think that people's answers to that you know um movement have been varied and those those various um answers have turned away people you know to, to like ethan's point it's not necessarily that you know our position on women's roles is incorrect it's just that the message that people are getting from the world you know is, is very different than what we have here um so i think you know when we when we look at this this particular subject yeah again like part of what pushes people away is the the anger and the um you know, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It gets forced down people's throats that maybe do have these feelings. I think that when we do approach brothers and sisters that may be dealing with these issues or just young people or whoever might be coming here, it's, it's out of a spirit of compassion. And like, how can we, you know, like, I, I, you know, how can we get you to see God's point of view in all this um, and still be like compassionate. I'm not saying like this is right or anything like that. I do think that like God is very explicit about how he feels about these issues in the Bible. Um, but I don't think that, you know, I think we still need to have some compassion when we talk to people with these issues. Because we do yeah. see a lot of people leaving simply because they don't get compassion. We've seen that a lot with women's roles. And we could see that a lot with this as well. Yeah, There's a lot going on, yes. Um, John and then Casey. Um, I, I see this as very similar to the time of Jeremiah when there was literally, you know, generations who had grown up seeing Baal intermingled in the temple side by side, if not blended together somehow. And eventually it got to the point where some some wholesale like just stop and reset had to occur and i i think that this is you know adam said nothing is new he's absolutely right that this is something that you know over time is just it's a rising tide and it's just leaching slowly and and surely you know into um, all, I guess, forms of worship, and we're certainly not um, immune. immune in any way. So, 
it's something that we need to be aware of because, I mean, literally people grew up not knowing that that was wrong, to have Baal intermingled at the temple, all these things in the temple that were absolutely, they could not exist together. And it took, um, you know, resolve for a stand to be made. And as Adam was saying, we have to, you know, there's always got to be compassion and love, but there has to be a distinction made that these things are not compatible. They're just not compatible. No, and, th and that's what Jeremiah said that you, you just quoted from is that, you know, a terrible thing has happened to my people. Evil has become good and good has become evil. So they flip-flopped and everybody just wants to, you know, cover the cracks with plaster and act like it's not a problem. And it's the inverse of holiness and, and righteousness that is um, very difficult. I would just say one more thing. Christadelphians are not the only ones going through this. This is happening to all the major Christian bodies. They're losing their young people universally. It's happening to the Baptists. It's happening to the Methodists. It's happening to all these different groups. We're not alone. What I think would be good is to try to figure out how to salvage what we have. So, um, Casey? Yeah, I think we have to be careful with the language that we use. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, Christadelphians just have a, um, a natural way of of uh, indicating we're right, the rest of the world is wrong. Everybody else is wrong, <laughs> we're, and we know what the right thing is. With, with, you know, whether we intend to say that or not, it still comes across. Um, I've heard it from my own kids, who I never would have uh, intentionally sent that message, that um, Christadelphians send that message, and also we use a certain shorthand um, you know, when we say homosexuality is wrong, you know, we know what we mean by that. We mean that the practice is not approved by God. Right. What our kids can hear is the way my brain works, the way I am wired is a sin. And that's not, that's not what we mean by that. Yep. And, and so we have to be really careful with our language. Yeah, I agree. Sensitivity is very important. So Rebecca, yeah. then Robert, then Daryl. Sorry, I, I couldn't agree with what Casey's saying more. It's all about the language and the compassion with which we try to educate our young people. But if we're waiting till 13, 14, we're too late. These conversations need to be had even younger than that because by middle school, this is already a thing. It's not starting in high school. It's a thing by seventh grade, sixth and seventh grade now. Oh. So um, I actually bought a, a Christian book. I'm doing a lot of research on this, how to have those conversations without alienating. What's, What's the name of the book? It's called Living in a Gray World. It's a Christian book about this very issue. And the author is? I don't know. Okay, I just was going to say if people wanted to get it, that'd yeah. be good. I'm Robert? Yeah, uh, we, a lot of times we, we talk about homosexual, homosexuality being wrong, but the bigger picture is that God doesn't look at, at uh, premarital relations as a whole, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual, is right. So that, I think talking about the bigger picture is important, and it doesn't isolate the, the homosexual-leaning type person. It's, God looks at all of it the same. Right. Exactly, and we, we tend to treat it with more gravity than others. And Robert or Daryl? And without straying too far off the subject, you know, um, it's, it's a question of right and wrong, of uh, uh, sin and not sin. Um, you know, there was a time when Christians had to meet in private, mm -hmm. and, um, and then the laws started aligning with Christianity, and things changed, but now things all of a sudden are always they're getting like you said they've always been bad but it seems like all of a sudden a lot of things are happening but you have to learn from your family what's right and wrong uh, and when i'm saying family in our case you know mother and father maybe it's not enough because you might stray a little bit so, but we've got the big family here right we've got the community 
in Christ, our family, we correct each other, and we're the ones that need to teach what's right and wrong. And um, that is our only hope. And as, as it gets bad, it's just going to be like it used to be, that, like it's always been. You've got to learn um, what is sin and, and right and wrong, the law, everything that you need from the family, and the extended you, family. You get into a great point because it's about discernment. And we have to be very careful how we present it because the world says, if you say anything against this group, what's going to happen to you? The big thing is you're going to get labeled, right? <laughs> and two, nobody's going to listen to you anymore. Three, we can add on to this list so that there's a, there's a huge responsibility and the, the, the slope for us just keeps getting steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper, meaning that it's more difficult it's more challenging on how to even present it and show God's path without being just completely dismissed, Rebecca. That's why what Casey's saying is very, very important. It's not that you're, you know, Christadelphians, we do we have a very narrow-minded way of saying things. Uh -huh. I think a lot of it is in the jargon and the, in the approach because we all have tendencies. Our brains are all wired, you know, I might have a tendency to want to drink. Somebody else might have a tendency that way, or somebody else might have a tendency to. But like Robert just said, these things are not what God wants for us. So approaching it as a bigger picture issue is the way to go and yeah. really start young. I agree. Thank you all so much for your comments. Um, I'm going to try to get through some of the rest of this because I know we've only got about five more minutes. So. Um, I also wanted to cover that this huge typhoon, which we didn't even hear about, hit the Philippines, um, and thousands had to escape the flooding, which you see down below. 100,000 people in several regions were evacuated, 17 people died. But it was a pretty unbelievable um, Cat 5 this time of year, you know, going through um, the Philippines. And they really were, I guess, not as well prepared for it as they should have been. Uh, but a lot of people were displaced and had to move to higher ground. Um, I did not send this week's <laughs> at all. Yes. Yep. Joseph? Yes. Uh, Martha texted in to us to say that in Canada, oops, sorry, it changed again. They're typing it on me. One second. In Canada, it's a law with a $500 fine not to teach repentance from this lifestyle. Gender dysphoria is a book about the issue. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, unfortunately, this is last week's stuff and not this week's. So, anyway, but we, we're out of time anyway. Um, so, I'll use it next week. But uh, there's lots of things going on right now with Ukraine, like I said. Um, Russia is constantly trying to erode it. Um, Putin thinks that the worst thing that happened in the 19th, or sorry, 20th century, 1900 to 2000, was the fall of communism in 1989. Um, so he, he thinks one of the worst uh, events, Putin, so he, he basically has said um, one of the worst tragedies that happened in that whole century was the collapse of cap sorry the collapse of communism, and he's always itching to get back all the stands below him, the Eastern Bloc countries, and so he's been chipping away at Ukraine, and we just don't see it because we're not paying attention to Ukraine's history. It's like well that's not who cares about Ukraine. But they've had Crimea taken away from them. They've had several counties taken away from them. And we, he just keeps encroaching because he's a giant bully and he can do these things. And the whole united front of you know, Canada, the United States, and Europe is trying to put pressure on him to stop all this. And I'll bring it up next week because I've got better maps. Yes, Randy, and then. Either you or somebody in the room brought up that he was looking for assurances that if he did attack Ukraine, that they wouldn't attack back. Is that, I didn't that, that one before. What, the, what he wants is for um, Ukraine not to become part of NATO. NATO and, and Ukraine is like, please, please, let us become part of NATO because they're going to have some assurance that if Russia does attack them, 
they're going to be supported by the other European nations and the United States. Yes, Stacy. Under the heading of those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. Yeah. Um, does this, what Putin is doing, does it bring back any images of small nations that were chipped away by Hitler when Hitler rose to power? Yeah, it's exactly um, like the Weimar Republic of 1933. Right, so it's, it's a little here, a little there, until mm -hmm. finally uh, the alligator's mouth is wide open, consuming um, everything in its path. It is, and it affects everybody in Europe because they're getting a lot of their oil from Russia, yes. Just our conversation this morning, we're seeing all of these dynamics that are going on at the same time. So our focus really needs to be, let's, let's keep our eyes on, on God, his message. Otherwise, we're just going to get so out of balance. Well, no, it's just about to, to watch and wait, which he tells us to do. So we're looking for his signs. But yeah, go ahead, continue. That's all I have to say. Late arriving news. Um, okay. Last thing from Martha, she said, Mama Bear Apologetics by Fair is a good book that Beth Lanton uses in her monthly classes about women and world views. So if any of the ladies are interested in that class, just let sis so Jessica know, and she can give you the link to those classes. Okay, great, thank you. Any other um, hands up? I, I was just noticing lately how little Israel is in the news. And if that's our focus, if that's where we're looking, well, well, okay, so things are happening in Israel, Jesus' return has to be soon. We're kind of disappointed lately. There's there's the UN resolution, okay. Um, there's but, there's three of them. <laughs> but actual actual activity in Israel has right. been pretty darn quiet. Well, it, they they have been doing night strikes on all the Iranian military in Syria because they can't have it there. It's too close to the Golan Heights. So people aren't interested, but that doesn't mean that is it happening. Whether it gets the press is a matter of who's in charge of the media, right? It's always been that way. Um, I was, yes, Walter? Yeah, since, since mainstream news never seems to have anything, I kind of have my little flip book thing on my phone that I like to look at. And the two main things that keep coming up about Israel, first is some of the best medical understanding about all this pandemics coming out of Israel. They're the ones who understand apparently God gave them some insight into these things. You don't hear much about that. Right. But then on the negative side, you know, you can't have a pause without the negative side of these guys. They're complaining about their companies, this NSO, this, these companies that have all this great spyware that's all over the world. So whenever you hear about Israel, it's always, oh, great thing. But then on the other hand, it's like, oh, they're terrible. So you never can seem to get a really good balance report. No, you can't. And okay. Martha just also mentioned